is here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hamas is again refusing to participate in hostage negotiations. They will not cooperate. They will not do this as the United States is getting pounded by the Houthis and they are disrupting the shipping lanes in the Red Sea. What is going on? Good evening. It is the Mark Levin Show. The great one is off tonight. It's me, Rich Zioli, with you from Talk Radio 1210 WPHD in Mark's hometown of Philadelphia. Got a lot to get to tonight, including, of course, more on the Biden corruption, the border situation. But what is happening in the Red Sea is an abomination. It really is. The United States of America needs to control those international shipping lanes. It needs to defend them, period, because the entire world economy is about to be affected by this. And if you want to avoid World War III, this is what you do. You use deterrence to make sure that the Houthi terrorists stop striking ships in the Red Sea, stop disrupting commerce. We have major corporations right now that are avoiding the Suez Canal and adding 14 hours of trip time to go around Africa, which is going to cause prices to drastically increase, cause supply chain problems, cause all kinds of disruptions, and absolutely have an effect on the prices that you and I pay for everything. And this is happening because the United States of America is still not willing to engage and call what the problem is. The problem is Iran. Kirby said it today. He said, Iran is behind the Houthis. We know this. And yet there are people, whack jobs in the Democrat Party who are rooting for the Houthis, rooting for Iran, rooting for Hamas against Israel. And Biden's afraid to make them upset. Biden's afraid to cross them because he needs their support if there's a Democrat primary. He has not shown up the base to get them out for the general election. He's very, very worried about turnout, and he should be, because there is a he, his poll numbers are terrible, and they're terrible within the Democrat base. So Biden's doing a little dance. He's doing a little dance here, you see. He's trying to keep the anti-Israel, anti-Semitic whack jobs happy, while he's also trying to say what he knows the overwhelming majority of Americans believe, which is that Israel needs to be able to defend itself, and that the Red Sea shipping lanes need to be protected, and that the, Isra- the, the Iranian-backed Houthi terrorists are that. They're terrorists. And that the United States of America needs to show force. Otherwise, this situation is going to spiral out of control. And there's going to be serious and deadly international consequences. Period. And we look like jokes again. We look like a joke because, once again, we are sitting back and allowing this to happen and doing nothing about it. So the the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, comes out and says, oh, we're going to send an international force down there to be able to try to try to keep order. And uh, and we're going to be doing that. And we're going to make sure that there's uh, there there, there's an orderly uh, transfer of ships going in. Hey, listen, it may be too late. Corporations are already doing exactly what they have to do. Big corporations, BP, Chevron and others. They're allowing all this to occur. And why? Why? We know that there's, um, without question, we know that Hamas is using the hospitals in Gaza. They are using them as their headquarters. A Gaza hospital boss admits he's a Hamas commander and used the medical facility as a terror base. He said he knew of 16 other employees who were members of Hamas. No question about it. And do you know that if you look at polling data, and you really have to worry about this, Half of young Americans say Israel should be ended and given to Hamas, according to a poll. But you see, when I tell you that colleges are indoctrination camps where you have these radical leftists who are there to indoctrinate your children at some of the most elite, prestigious and expensive universities in the country. I'm not joking. I'm not exaggerating. You can see it for yourself. There are people rooting for Hamas, even though they have raped women, even though what they, the horrible things they've done to children, to innocent civilians, to their own, to, to, to their fellow Muslims, let alone the fact that they wanted to see death to all the Jews and the destruction of Israel. And yet you have young people that are siding with them. Well, it was amazing yesterday. I'm watching uh, as the protesters in New York City at Penn Station and Grand Central Station are displaying all their banners. And one of their banners is gays for a united Palestine. Really? Gays for United Palestine. Because that, that's because that's what they tolerate over there. They tolerate that in Palestine. Give me a break. I am I'm telling you right now, the the fecklessness of America, watching the United States of America look foolish on the world stage in this in this moment is really bad. At the same time, our southern border is being overwhelmed. And today the White House took issue with Governor Greg Abbott and his decision to sign a law that says Texas 
will prosecute people who cross into the country illegally. He's not going after American citizens who drive in. Of course, you have the right to do that. He's talking about people that cross into Texas illegally. And he pointed out correctly that the Constitution empowers the state to handle the situation if the federal government will not. So you think about that, and all of a sudden you turn around and you say to yourself, okay, well, if that's the case then, then why, why is the White House opposing this? And the White House is opposing it because they want open borders. That's it. That's the bottom line. They want open borders. We had another massive record day. 14,509 illegal aliens were encountered at the southern border yesterday. Those are the ones we know about. Those are the ones that we know were encountered because we don't know what we don't know. We don't know who got away. We have no way of knowing that, obviously. But when you look at this and you turn around and you read a very interesting article in Politico today, probably one of the two best things I've read all day. And what's really amazing about this article is it says <clears throat> Mexicans are looking forward to Trump's return. That's right. Mexican Americans in Texas who have all agreed that the situation is completely out of control and Biden has destroyed it. So Politico forced to confront the reality of this. There are a lot of Mexican people looking forward to Trump. A visit to the border city of El Paso shows how the politics of immigration are shifting and what's really underneath it. And as you go through this and you read it and they start talking to some people, people who are, in fact, uh, Mexican, people who are Democrat voters, and they all say that the situation is a complete and utter cluster F. The city's Democrat mayor, Oscar Leeser, said at a news conference the city had reached a breaking point. So then this reporter for Politico goes out and starts talking to people who actually live there. And I'm sure he's waiting to find people going on about how Trump is awful and Trump is vile and they can't stand his language. And, and uh, all the people of El Paso probably believe everybody should come here, particularly if they're Latino, of Latino heritage. But then they actually start talking to people and they realize that's not the case. That's not the case. The growing appeal of a pro-Trump hardline immigration mentality was even evident here in a city where more than 80 percent of the population is Hispanic or Latino and in a county where Biden pummeled Trump by more than 35 percentage points three years ago. The reporter says he walks into El Paso's downtown where the city's Winterfest was in full swing and he starts talking to people eating churros. So one guy named Rick Delgado, a Navy veteran, said, get the key and lock the gates. Get the key and lock the gates. Lives in El Paso, and he's had it. He said he leans Democrat, and he keeps the U.S. Customs and Border Protection number in his phone. He said he thinks Biden's doing whatever he can, but it was the state, not the Biden administration, that had strung razor wire on the Texas side of the Rio Grande and passed legislation that would authorize police to arrest migrants. And guess what? This guy agrees with that. So despite what the White House says and what Corrine Jean-Pierre says when she talks about, oh, how inhumane it is to put razor wire to protect the state or to have the state have the ability to arrest people who are crossing into the state illegally, despite what the White House says, the people on the ground all agree with it. And they know it's what has to happen. So this guy Delgado said, Greg Abbott's doing a better job. Nearby eating popcorn with his hot sauce, Ray Rosales, an executive chef, was born, was born just across the border in Juarez, Mexico. He said, quote, Trump, he started rough. But now that you see it, when Biden came in, he messed everything up. He said there are a lot of Mexican people looking forward to Trump. How do you like them apples, huh? On a small stage, a performer began to sing Feliz Navidad, and a boy tugged his mother, and they walked by Mickey Mouse Christmas sweaters, and this other person starts talking, and she says, everything's gone to S in a handbasket. It's getting really bad with a lot of people coming in. This woman was born in Mexico in Chihuahua, immigrated with her family when she was 12. She didn't vote for Trump in 2016, she said, but lately she's thinking differently about it. Now I want Trump back, she says. See, this is not what the corporate media tells you, right? The corporate media tells you that people like her are disgusted with Trump. They can't stand his rhetoric. Uh, They want open borders. They believe it's inhumane what Trump wants to do. Uh, No, 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 not at all. Actually, they want him back because they know he's the only one who can actually deal with the situation. And they know that Biden has allowed the border situation to be wide open and is doing absolutely nothing about it. And they see with their own eyes. 
and they see that this is the battle going on every single day. So where do they want as they as they watch Joe Biden talk about uh, Republicans and their cruelty and everything like this? They want somebody to deal with the border situation. They want somebody to go in there and fix this problem. This one person, Garcia, whose family fled Cuba when he was nine years old, said he doesn't consider himself a member of either political party. He spent years ministering to immigrants and represents something of an old school liberal approach to the topic. But he said he understands what crowds of migrants can look like on TV or to people who come around here and they drive around. They say, why are all these people here? This is not controllable. This is not good. Now, Trump won. And Trump won 28 percent of the Latino vote in the last election. I think it's going to be higher this time around. From 2018 to 2020 to 2022, the Democrat advantage over Republicans among Hispanic voters has shrunk from 47 percentage points to 25 percentage points to 21 percentage points. Let me say that again. If you go back from 2018 to 2020 to 2022. The Democratic advantage over Republicans among Hispanic voters has shrunk from 47, where it was the highest in 2018, to 25 percentage points in 2020, to 21 percentage points in 2022. And it isn't clear that immigration as an issue is doing anything to arrest the decline, the eroding decline among Democrats, even in Texas, where shifting demographics had for years been presumed likely to eventually turn the state blue, more than 40 percent of Hispanic voters surveyed this year by the Texas Politics Project at the University of Texas said they agreed with the idea of deporting undocumented immigrants living in the United States. 40% of Hispanic voters. When Republicans were in control and effing up and Trump was as extreme as he was in his first campaign, all that stuff did was to our benefit said a top Democrat pollster, but I think it always had a half-life. And right now the problem is on our watch. And whatever's happening, it's Biden's responsibility. And there's a sense that things are slipping out of control again. Yeah, you think? Really? The idea that Biden is principally responsible for this weighs heavily on Democrats. And this reporter is shocked. Of course, he goes down there not anticipating any of this. And then he starts talking to people and finding all this stuff out and realizing, oh my God, you mean these people actually like Trump? They actually like what he wants to do. They like his policies. They actually want to secure border. They want to deport people. What? In 2020, Trump did better in El Paso County than he had four years earlier, cutting his losing margin by about eight percentage points. But that's still pretty good. If you think about it, an area, El Paso County, where in 2016, uh, Trump got crushed. But this is where things are headed for 2024. Now you have Democrats who are suing the White House and you have a Texas governor who's trying to do something about the problem and the people back him. And then what does the Biden White House do? Because again, it's so worried about its base. It's so worried about the Democrat Party base, the open borders, whack jobs that they're coming out today and they're going to fight them. They're going to fight Texas on this. And they go on about how inhumane this is and how cruel this is and how people are going to be hurt by this and blah, blah, blah. And this is why they're going to lose. This is why they're going to get trounced. This headline says it all. 2024, there are a lot of Mexican people looking forward to Trump from Politico. Not exactly a far right-wing site. 877-381-3811. This is the Mark Levin Show. It's Rich Zioli in for the great one. The Colorado Supreme Court has ordered Trump off the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment. I'll have updates for you on that breaking story. Don't go away. Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, folks, with essential information about a possible digital dollar and its impact on IRAs and 401ks. Don't be left in the dark. Educate yourself before a digital dollar comes with Augusta Precious Metals' downside of the digital dollar report. Created due to popular demand, this report is packed with important digital dollar insights. It digs into concerns about privacy, cybersecurity, and more. Best of all, it shares a strategy smart investors have used to hedge against economic uncertainties like the digital dollar. Act now to learn more with Augusta Precious Metals. Do it for your financial future. Receive the free downside of the digital dollar report today by texting LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, text LEVIN to 68592 or go to AugustaPreciousMetals.com. 
Text date and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Some major breaking news here on the Mark Levin Show. Major, major breaking news. The Colorado Supreme Court. This just came our way, Mr. Producer, a minute ago. The state Supreme Court has just kicked Donald Trump off the ballot. Just happened moments ago, a four to three ruling. The Colorado Supreme Court removed former President Donald Trump from the state's 2024 ballot, ruling that he isn't an eligible presidential candidate because of the 14th Amendment's insurrectionist ban. The ruling will be placed on hold pending until January 4th. The state Supreme Court decision only applies to Colorado, but this historic ruling will Royal, the 2024 campaign, CNN says it tees up an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which, of course, obviously will decide on this. Colorado election officials have said the matter needs to be settled by January 5th, which is a statutory deadline to set the list of candidates for the GOP primary. Now, number one, Donald Trump has never been even charged with committing an insurrection or giving aid and comfort to those who have. That's number one. Certainly has not been convicted of that. Number two. Number three, as Mark has explained to you many, many times, the 14th Amendment, Section 3 of the so-called Insurrectionist Clause specifically does not apply to presidents. It, 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 it purposely leaves out the president from the list of all the offices who are affected by 14 Section 3. But nevertheless, we knew, this, we, we knew this is what they would do. We knew that the left would do this. They would do anything they possibly can to stop Donald Trump. That's what this was all about This was all about this. When they went after the Proud Boys and they found them guilty of seditious conspiracy, when they leveled those charges at them, and even you had people, civil libertarians on both sides of the aisle who were coming out and saying, listen, this is not seditious conspiracy. These charges, this is an overreach here. These charges are way out of line, way too far. Prosecutorial misconduct here. This is way too much of a reach. But I knew why they were doing it, because they wanted to find these guys guilty. And in a D.C. jury, that's easy. You don't even have to show any evidence. They just come back with a guilty verdict. And then they want to say that Donald Trump gave them aid and comfort, and therefore he gave aid and comfort to the insurrectionists, and therefore he can't be on the ballot. That's what they're hoping for. That's their big, that's their big goal here. That's what this lunatic special prosecutor, Jack Smith, who's on his crusade, He's trying to do because they know they can't beat him. They know they, they know he's going to win. He's going to win if he's the nominee in 2024, period. I think any Republican wins, but, I, but Trump's definitely going to win. The establishment that's trying to stop him right now and get behind Nikki Haley, they're all saying Trump can't win, but that's not true. They know he can. That's why they want to stop him. The Republican establishment is terrified of the fact that Trump can win, as is the Democrat establishment, obviously. But when you hear people say to you he can't win, no, that's a lie. They, they know he can win. They know he will win. And that's why they want to try to stop him. So now what you have here is you have a situation where the other blue states are all going to try to do this. And the problem is some of these states are going to be must-win states. The good news, though, is I do not think the United States Supreme Court is going to let this stand. Not even close. I think the United States Supreme Court is going to say absolutely not. We'll have more on this for you. Breaking news here on the Mark Levin Show with me, Rich Zioli, in for the great one coming right back. Mark Levin here, folks, with essential information about a possible digital dollar and its impact on IRAs and 401ks. Don't be left in the dark. Educate yourself before a digital dollar comes with Augusta Precious Metals' downside of the digital dollar report. Created due to popular demand, this report is packed with important digital dollar insights. It digs into concerns about privacy, cybersecurity, and more. Best of all, it shares a strategy smart investors have used to hedge against economic uncertainties like the digital dollar. Act now to learn more with Augusta Precious Metals. Do it for your financial future. Receive the free downside of the digital dollar report today by texting LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N. To 68592. Again, text Levin to 68592 or go to AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Text aid and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Liberty's voice, Mark Levin. Talk with that voice now. 877 381 3811. The great one, Mark Levin, is off tonight. It's me, Rich Zioli, in with you from Mark's hometown of Philadelphia. 
where I do the afternoon drive show on Talk Radio 1210 WPHD. Uh, breaking news tonight. The Colorado Supreme Court has just ruled that former President Donald Trump is ineligible to be on the state's ballot. Now, the decision just came out a few moments ago, and I'm reading it, and I'm reading it as I go. But I want to, before I get into the ruling here by the court, I want to just go over what is in the text of the 14th Amendment, which what is known as the Disqualification Clause, all right? Now, I know Mark's talked to you about this in the past, but it's worth reminding. 14th Amendment, Section 3, says the following, quote, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. Now, what don't you hear in that? No person shall be a president. You don't hear the word president here. They list senator, representative in Congress, elector of president and vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States, which clearly does not include the presidency. You'd list that first because it's the highest of the offices. So they purposely don't include president in that list. They don't bar somebody from becoming president in that list. That's number one. Number two, when has Donald Trump been found to have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States? When did that happen? I missed that. When did that trial happen? When did that, when did that conclusion, when was that reached by, by a jury of, of his peers in, in federal court? Did did Congress rule on that? No, they impeached him, but he was not convicted in the Senate. So when did this when did this magic insurrection or rebellion against the United States happen? When was he found guilty of this? Or is this just the Colorado Supreme Court coming to their determination on this? And that's exactly what it is. The Colorado Supreme Court has now determined. Based on this now, let's see here now, uh, the district court concluded a five-day trial. So the district court originally found that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection, as those terms are used in Section 3. They did a five-day trial. But the district court concluded Section 3 does not apply to the president. Well, the court was correct in that. Section 3 does not. Therefore, the court denied the petition to keep President Trump off the presidential primary ballot The electors and President Trump sought this court's review of various rulings by the district court. We affirm in part and reverse in part. We hold as follows. The election code allows the electors to challenge President Trump's status as a qualified candidate based on Section 3. Indeed, the election code provides the electors their only viable means of litigating whether President Trump is disqualified from holding office under Section 3. Congress does not need to pass implementing legislation for Section 3's disqualification provision to attach. And Section 3 is, in that sense, self-executing. Judicial review of President Trump's eligibility for office under Section 3 is not precluded by the political question doctrine. Section 3 encompasses the office of the presidency and someone who has taken an oath as president. On this point, the district court committed reversible errors. So what the Supreme Court of Colorado is finding is that the district court was wrong and Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does apply to presidents. The district court did not abuse its discretion in admitting portions of Congress's January 6th report into evidence at trial. The district court did not err in concluding that the events at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th constituted an an insurrection. The district court did not err in concluding that President Trump engaged in that insurrection through his personal actions. President Trump's speech inciting the crowd that breached the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021 was not protected by the First Amendment. This is what the Colorado Supreme Court's finding here. This is the, this is the opinion of the Colorado Supreme Court. Make no mistake about this. I mean, the, these courts are out of control. I, I dealt with this in Pennsylvania with the 2020 election when the court came out and changed the time matter in place of the election. And the Supreme Court decided that if you returned a mail-in ballot, didn't have a postmark date on it, or the date was ineligible, you didn't sign it, uh, it it didn't matter, they counted it anyway. This is, this is, 
this is what we have to deal with with these courts. These courts are a bunch of leftist activists, and they are hell-bent on stopping Donald Trump. That's what we're seeing here play out. So let's just go through a couple of these things here. Number one, President Trump's speech inciting the crowd, which Jack Smith, the special counsel, has not charged Trump with an insurrection. He has not charged Trump with committing insurrection, nor has he charged Trump with giving aid and comfort to those who have, or aiding and abetting. Those charges have not been filed. Now, maybe they'll come. Jack Smith is is hell-bent on going after Trump. He's hell-bent on stopping him. So maybe those charges will be added. They certainly can add new charges, and I wouldn't put it past this guy. But at no point as of this moment has anyone, other than the Colorado Supreme Court, found Trump to be guilty of an insurrection. And my question is, what trial did the Supreme Court conduct to determine this? They didn't. They looked at the trial that was done at the, at the district court, a five-day trial, and concluded that, that he did, in fact, commit an insurrection in the course of this district court trial in Colorado. Because Colorado has the ability to adjudicate what would be federal offenses. Of course not. That would be federal court. And no federal court has found Donald Trump guilty of these things. There's not even federal charges around this yet. President Trump's speech inciting the crowd that breached the U.S. Capitol was not protected by the First Amendment. Well, of course it was. He said march down there peacefully, but even if he didn't use the word peacefully, he never told anybody to commit any violence. He didn't tell anybody to go smash windows. He didn't tell anybody to to, to fight with barricades or cops. or he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say to do any of those things. So how can you argue that he told people to do those things. Forget incitement. This is a, this is a, a dumb word that has no legal meaning. My words inc- incite somebody to take action. I didn't tell them to do that. I didn't give them the idea to do that. They thought of this on their own. There's no proof that Donald Trump told any of these people what to do that day. Anyone who broke the law that day, there's not been a scintilla of evidence that Trump told them to do it. So they heard words and they made interpretations in their mind and they did things. And that's on them as individuals. And even in all the trials that happened with the January 6th protesters, they would not allow Donald Trump to be used as their defense. In other words, they, the court would not allow the January 6th defendants to say, Trump made me do it. They wouldn't allow that as a defense. So where's that precedent right there? That should be precedent that the Colorado Supreme Court uses and says that that the the trial court in D.C. would not allow Trump's words to be an excuse for the actions of the January 6th protesters. Let me continue here. Uh, The sum of these parts is this. President Trump is disqualified from holding the office of president under Section 3 because he is disqualified. It would be a wrongful act under the election code for the secretary, I assume secretary of state, to list him as a candidate on the presidential primary ballot. We do not reach these conclusions lightly. We are mindful of the magnitude and weight of the questions now before us. We are likewise mindful of our solemn duty to apply the law without fear or favor and without being swayed by public reaction to the decisions that the law mandates we reach. We are also cognizant that we travel in uncharted territory and that this case presents several issues of first impression. But for our resolution of the elector's challenge under the election code, the secretary would be required to include President Trump's name on the 2024 presidential primary ballot. Therefore, to maintain the status quo pending any review by the U.S. Supreme Court, we stay our ruling until January 4th, 2024. That is the day before the Secretary of State's deadline to certify the content of the presidential primary ballot. If review is sought in the Supreme Court before the stay expires on January 4th, 2024, then the stay shall remain in place and the Secretary will continue to be required to include President Trump's name on the 2024 presidential primary ballot until the receipt of any other mandate from the Supreme Court. So essentially now what the court is saying is, look, we know this is going to go to the Supreme Court. We obviously know this is going to be challenged. And it's going to be fast-tracked to the Supreme Court and they're going to hear this. Now, I, I, in my opinion, I think the United States Supreme Court is going to reach very different conc- conclusions here. Number one, starting with the most obvious conclusion, which is that Donald Trump has not been found guilty of committing an insurrection or giving aid and comfort to those who have. That's number one. There has not been any charge that he gave aid and comfort to the Proud Boys, that he helped them commit whatever seditious conspiracy the government threw at them with charges, which they were found guilty of, which I knew, I knew when they came back with that, with that verdict, that they were going to then use that to go after Trump. That's why everybody on the left and in the Republican establishment has always kept using the word insurrection for a reason. 
because they wanted the disqualification clause under 14, Section 3 to count towards him. But you have to be found liable for that, and Trump has not been. So then they go back into the background here. They say, on January 6, 2021, pursuant to the 12th Amendment, U.S. Constitution Amendment 12, and the Electoral Count Act 3 U.S.C. 15, Congress convened a joint session to certify the Electoral College votes. President Trump held a rally that morning at the Ellipse in Washington, which he, along with several others, spoke to the attendees. In his speech, which began around noon, President Trump persisted in rejecting the election results, telling his supporters that we won in a landslide and we will never concede. Well, you have the right to say that. If not, Stacey Abrams should be in prison right now. Stacey Abrams should be rotting in a jail cell. If you don't have the right to say that you won and you'll not concede, Stacey Abrams should be in prison. He said, walk down to the Capitol and show strength and that if they did not fight like hell, they would not have a country anymore. You see what the Supreme Court leaves out here. Not that I think it's relevant, but he said, we will peacefully walk down to the Capitol. Peacefully. But it doesn't matter. I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to put, a, put a clause in there to justify uh, a march. I don't, think, I don't think it's necessary in this country. There's no requirement under the First Amendment that you have to tell people if they're going to go protest their government, they have to be peaceful. It's implied. It's implied that people should know how to act as adults and that they have a right to protest. They don't have a right to commit violence. It's implied. If I tell everybody, okay, tomorrow we're all going to go down to uh, Independence Mall and we're going to protest this ruling, I don't have to say peacefully. It's implied. If you then are not peaceful, that's on you. That's, that's a decision that you make as a, as a protester. That's a decision that you make as an individual. I don't, have to, I don't have to say peacefully, right? Because you're an adult and you're supposed to understand the law and you're supposed to understand how this works. But nevertheless, he did say it. Trump did say we will, we will peacefully walk down there. But the Supreme Court, of course, conveniently leaves that out. Before his speech ended, portions of the crowd began moving toward the Capitol. Below, we will discuss additional facts regarding the events of January 6th as relevant to the legal issues before us. Uh, Penn certified the votes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see here now. President Trump intervened and almost immediately filed a notice of removal of federal court once the electors filed proof. This is just sort of the procedural stuff here. I'm just kind of passing through this here. Uh, let's see here. T -t 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 this has been going on for a couple weeks, obviously in Colorado. Analysis. Okay. We begin with an overview of Section 3. We then address threshold questions regarding whether the election code provides a basis for review of the elector's claim, whether Section 3 requires implementing legislation before its disqualification provision attaches, and whether Section 3 poses a non uh I can't, I can't see that word. After concluding that these threshold issues do not, this app is terrible here, this Scrib app, whatever it is. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and Principles of Constitutional Interpretation. This is the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling here. Here's what I'll do. Let me take a quick break. I'll come back. I'll have more of this for you. This is all breaking news. The Colorado Supreme Court banning Donald Trump from being on the ballot. Pending, of course, a review by the United States Supreme Court. I think the United States Supreme Court is going to interpret this much differently, but I want to get all the facts here. I want to I want to understand exactly the court's reasoning. This is this is the effort. This is going to be the battle. This is not and this is not going to be the only state that's, that, that, that stops here. And the the problem is that if the court comes back and says Trump hasn't been charged with that or found guilty of that, you know what's going to happen. Jack Smith, the special counsel hell bent on getting Trump is going to add those charges if he hasn't already, meaning that he may be working on adding those charges right now, anticipating this. Because they know Trump's going to win and they have to do whatever they possibly can to stop him from being on the ballot. This is the only thing they have. This is the only ace up their sleeve they have. Good news is I do not think it's going to work. I think the Supreme Court's going to see through this. But you never know, obviously. But I believe, based on the interpretation of what Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says and the fact that Trump has not been found guilty of an insurrection, but even if he was, it does not apply to president. It does not list that. But you never know how the courts are going to go. This is what they want to do. This is what they're up to. I've got a lot to say on this, and I want to hear from you on this as well. Here on The Mark Levin Show, it's me, Rich Zioli, on Twitter, at Rich Zioli. Coming right back. Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, folks, with essential information about a possible digital dollar and its impact on IRAs and 401ks. Don't be left in the dark. 
Educate yourself before a digital dollar comes with Augusta Precious Metals' downside of the digital dollar report. Created due to popular demand, this report is packed with important digital dollar insights. It digs into concerns about privacy, cybersecurity, and more. Best of all, it shares a strategy smart investors have used to hedge against economic uncertainties like the digital dollar. Act now to learn more with Augusta Precious Metals. Do it for your financial future. Receive the free downside of the digital dollar report today by texting LEVIN to 68592. That's L-E-V-I-N to 68592. Again, text LEVIN to 68592 or go to AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Text aid and message rates may apply. Performance varies. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get risk disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. All right, so the breaking news, the Colorado Supreme Court has kicked Trump off the Colorado Republican primary ballot. Uh, Breaking news here on the Mark Levin Show with me, Rich Zioli, in for the great one tonight. Great to be with you. Couple couple, uh, top line thoughts, first of all. Obviously, the Supreme Court's going to have to make a decision here. No question about it. But the, but the, the timing of this, I mean, this is, this is, the stay here is January 4th, because January 5th is when the Colorado law says you have to designate the primary ballots. But I don't, I don't know if that gives the Supreme Court time enough to weigh, and the Supreme Court may turn around and tell Colorado, go scratch. You're not, you, 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 you do nothing until we tell you to. You got to extend your deadline, you extend your deadline which is what I would imagine would be the case. And the court acknowledges that in their ruling, basically saying, well, you know, if, we, if we're told to, to keep this going, this stay, then we will. But this is, this is not a surprise. I'm not surprised by this. I'm not surprised by this in the least. I have been predicting this for quite some time, that this is what they would do. They would try to keep Trump off the ballot. Everything around the charges by Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, everything around January 6th is all designed for this, for this moment. But for the Colorado Supreme Court to make the determination that A, Section 14, Article 14, Section 3, excuse me, of the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, applies to presidents is absolutely, their, their, their judgment on this is completely wrong. Their reasoning on this is completely wrong. And I've been glancing at this. Again, this all just kind of broke here about 6.15 tonight. And then secondly, when has Trump ever been found guilty of participating in an insurrection? When has he been found guilty of giving aid and comfort to those who have? He hasn't. Congress impeached him, but he was acquitted by the Senate. So if you want to use that as precedent, then you've got to say he was acquitted of those charges. He's not been found guilty of them. So how can you apply that against him to bar him from being on the ballot? See, this is bold. I didn't think the court would do this just yet. I knew they were going to try to do this. I knew that states would try to keep him off the ballot. I had no, no, no doubt in my mind about that. No doubt whatsoever. But I didn't think they would do it now. I didn't think he would do it now. They would do it now. I figured they would wait and try to do it until Jack Smith had filed charges. Because they might have a problem now for the fact, considering the fact that there aren't any charges. But that may also be bad news for Trump, too. I'll explain it all. I'll break it down for you. It's the Mark Levin Show. The great one's off tonight. Rich Zeolian for Mark. 877-381-3811. Coming right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. They are trying to deny you the right to vote for who you want for president of the United States. That's what they're doing. The people that are screaming about saving democracy are trying to destroy the republic by taking away your right to vote for the candidate you want. Welcome to the show. Glad you're here. It is the Mark Levin Show. The great one's off tonight. Rich Zioli from Mark's hometown of Philadelphia. Talk Radio 1210 WPHD. Uh, Happy to be with you, my fellow Levinites. This breaking news, the Colorado Supreme Court ruling in a very, very close decision here. 4-3, that 
Former President Trump is ineligible to be on the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, Section 3, the Disqualification Clause under so-called insurrection or rebellion against the United States. Now, first of all, let's understand why they're doing this. They're doing this because they know that Trump can win. They know this. The Democrats did a very, very sneaky thing, and that is that they went after Trump in court, hoping that it would prop him up to become the Republican nominee, believing that he'd be the easiest one to beat, and they were wrong. They were so wrong with this idea. Their approach, their tactics, their strategy were completely idiotic. But they're idiots, so you're not surprised by that. But that's what they were doing. They wanted Trump to be the nominee. And they knew if they kept coming after him in court versus just ignoring the guy, it would rally the base, it would rally people, and he'd become the nominee. And that's what's going to happen. But then something happened. Joe Biden's popularity, which was never there in the first place, plummeted even further, where he's down to, what, 33% on a good day? And you have Democrats now fleeing Biden. You've got black voters, Latino voters all coming around and saying Trump's a better choice. You have a border that's wide open. You have an economy that is still hurting a lot of people out there with these ridiculous inflation rates. And so Trump can win. So now they have to decide, how do we stop him? Because we made a big mistake, doing everything we could to elevate him as the candidate. And now he's going to win. And the establishment cannot allow that to occur. The swamp can't allow that to occur because he will drain the swamp. This time it's personal. It's like Jaws 2, The Revenge. This time it's personal. He went through it the first time, and he had a deal with these people who told him, oh, don't do that, Mr. President. Try this approach, Mr. President. And he surrounded himself very early on with a lot of establishment types in the Republican Party. Meanwhile, the deep state was working to remove him from office every single day with phony Russian collusion nonsense, trying to undermine his presidency, hoping to make him unpopular. The Republican Party would remove him as some sort of a Russian agent. They tried for years. They went after him with two impeachments. They went after him with a Mueller investigation that cost, what, $60, $70 million? And now they're trying to keep him off the ballot to deny you the right to vote for him because they know you want to, and they know you will, and they know he'll win. First of all, the disqualification clause does not count towards presidents, number one. Number two, he has not been found guilty of an insurrection. What does that even mean exactly? First of all, I wanted to let you know that his campaign has put out a statement. And they have said the following, and I'm going to share this with you right now. Uh, Trump campaign statement on the Colorado Supreme Court ruling. They put this out on social media just a short time ago. uh, And they're not surprised. They said, unsurprisingly, the all-Democrat-appointed Colorado Supreme Court has ruled against President Trump, supporting a Soros-funded left-wing group scheme to interfere in election on behalf of crooked Joe Biden by removing President Trump's name from the ballot and eliminating the rights of Colorado voters to vote for the candidate of their choice. Democrat Party leaders are in a state of paranoia over the growing dominant lead President Trump has amassed in the polls. They have lost faith in the failed Biden presidency and are now doing everything they can to stop the American voters from throwing them out of office next November. The Colorado Supreme Court issued a completely flawed decision tonight, and we will swiftly file an appeal to the United States Supreme Court and a concurrent request for a stay of this deeply undemocratic decision. We have full confidence that the United States Supreme Court will quickly rule in our favor and finally put an end to these un-American lawsuits. I agree. I do think that they will rule in Trump's favor. I have no question about it. I do believe that. And the reason why is because it's very clear what office is not included here, and that is president. As Mark wrote in an article for The Blaze back in September, he wrote the following, the Democrat Party's fetish for the 14th Amendment is a vile attack on our elections directed at one man, Donald Trump. And by the way, the Democrat Party, based on that sex tape, the Senate staffer sex scandal, they have a lot of fetishes. These people have a lot of fetishes, very unhealthy ones. But one of their big fetishes, of course, is, is, is getting Trump. It's an obsession with these people. It's an obsession. He writes the following, he says, You need not be an aging retired judge, washed up former law professor, or never Trumper academic to notice that the word president cannot be found in the text. So why would the amendment's drafters, adopters, and ratifiers all exclude president from the text but include virtually every other form of office holder, federal and state, elected and appointed in the text of the 14th Amendment? Did they forget to add the word president? Or or could the reason possibly be that they did not want to include the word president and therefore intentionally 
did not. Of course, there is nothing anywhere that even suggests the drafters, adopters, or ratifiers intended otherwise. It took two never-Trump law professors, members of the Federalist Society, no less, joining the Democrat Party mob over 125 pages to try to convince us that by omitting the word president, not only did the drafters, adopters, and ratifiers intend to include the president, but the proper interpretation of the amendment and its construction and application make it undeniable and clear. So let me just break that down into layman's terms. We left out the word president to make it very clear we intended to include the president. Uh, Then why didn't you just put the word president in there? Save us all a lot of time, right? But these two these two law professors came around and said, oh, no, no, it took them 125 pages to, 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 to come to this conclusion to prove their point, which they didn't prove. But 125 pages to say, oh, absolutely. By by leaving out the word president, they did so to fully convince you that they meant to include and absolutely apply this to president. It's sort of like a Jedi mind trick, I guess. If we put the word president there, you may not think we meant to include president. So we left it out on purpose and put a lot of other clauses in there so it'd be undeniably clear that we included the president. I'm sorry, I'm not a, a legal scholar, but let me just ask the obvious question. Why not just add the word president? Were you, did you have an ink shortage? Were you worried about making it fit? Like, the, like, like making sure that the paragraph was properly aligned or something? Why, why leave it out then? If, you're, if, if, if the conclusion of these legal scholars is that they absolutely meant to have this apply to the president, but they list all these other offices but not president, well, then just add the word president. Instead of saying that the proper interpretation of the amendment and its construction and application make it undeniable and clear. It's not undeniable, and it's certainly not clear, unless you can say it's undeniable that they did not include the word president. That is undeniable. The word is not there. That's not subject to debate. The word is not there, period. So I'm crystal clear on that fact. Mark says, in fact, so clear are these professors and their ilk that we are supposed to intuit the intention of the drafters, adopters, and ratifiers by, among other things, the words as an officer of the United States. Thus, this phrase, we are told, should be read to include the word president. Therefore, there was no need to single out by name the most powerful and important governmental official in the entire country. Well, then why would you include all the other offices? Why would you then include senator, member of the House, electors of the president, and the vice president? Why would you include those? Why not just say officers of the United States? Why not just save everybody trouble and just say anybody, anybody, nobody can. Anybody in or nobody can. Something very simple like that. See, the, the parsing of these words here by these people who want to stop Trump is just, it's, it's, it's amazing. Oh, by not including the word president, we meant president. It's very obvious. And by saying officers of the United States, we didn't have to list president, even though we listed all those other offices of the United States. Well, then why'd you list those other offices? If officers of the United States covers it all, then it covers it all. Therefore, he writes, there was no need to single out by name the most important, I read that, and why not? After all, the local South Carolina county commissioners were not specifically mentioned either. This is preposterous. For most people, the absurdity is self-evident. Indeed, if they intended to include the president, you'd think he would not only be mentioned, but that he'd be at the top of the list. In fact, they even mention elector of president and vice president, but not the president himself, which, of course, tells me that they knew how to spell the word president. It wasn't a question of, well, what should we include the president? Uh, Jimmy, I don't know how to spell it, so leave it out. They put elector as a president, so they, they, they were thinking of the presidency. But they put that, but not the president. Because they wanted to make it so obvious they intended to include the president, they left it out. Moreover, what does the phrase shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States mean? Great question. If you're going to bar the leading Republican candidate for the presidency from even appearing on a state ballot, thereby disenfranchising untold members of civilians who would like to vote for him, citizens who would like to vote for him, and potentially alter the course and outcome of a presidential election, there should be some definitive way to know what this phrase means and who gets to make that decision. Obviously, as the 14th Amendment is one of these so-called Civil War amendments, we know what was meant when the amendment was ratified. 
engaging in insurrection or rebellion on behalf of the Confederacy and against the Union. It wasn't very difficult to figure out who did or did not engage in such activities or what was meant by insurrection or rebellion. They didn't need law professors or members of the Democrat Party, the Party of the Confederacy, to tell them, but did the drafters, adopters, and ratifiers intend Section 3 to apply beyond the death of the last Confederate? Of course, there's no evidence that it did, other than the wishful meanderings and self-serving declarations of the proponents. Strangely, however, if that was the true intention and purpose, the amendment doesn't provide any guidance on how these decisions would be presented and resolved in the case of a presidential candidate or president. I say strangely because at the Constitutional Convention, the framers spent a great deal of time debating and working through the way we elect presidents. Electoral College. The Twelfth Amendment. So then why not go through the trouble then of figuring out the process to use to deny somebody the ability to be president? For example, how do you determine this? I mean, Donald Trump has not been charged, let alone convicted of such an offense. So then who gets to decide? The Colorado Supreme Court? A district court in Colorado, they get to make that decision? Which would then affect the entire country? One state can make that decision. So I have a question then. If in uh, Texas they hold a trial and find Joe Joe Biden guilty of, uh, of bribery and high crimes and misdemeanors, can they impeach him? Can they remove him from office? Can they say he's, he's not eligible to be on the ballot because he engaged in bribery and therefore he should be impeached? And even though Congress didn't impeach him, we determined that they should have and therefore we're not going to let him on our ballot. Can we, can, can we play that game? We'll just, as a state, we'll just usurp Congress. We'll just usurp the federal constitution. And we'll just find these things on our own. And then we'll make those determinations for the other states in the union. We'll just do that. So we'll just turn around and we'll say, Joe Biden's guilty of bribery because he took money from Hunter. We have a sham trial and we conclude that he is. And therefore, we say he should be impeached. And since he's impeached and removed from office, he's ineligible to be on the ballot. And we're not going to put Joe Biden on the ballot. We'll just have have at it. We'll just have the states hold their own trials and make their determinations. Forget Congress. forget, Forget the federal courts. The state will do it. They'll hold their little mock trials, little kangaroo courts, right? And come up with powers that are only delegated to Congress in the Constitution, but apply to themselves. Congress did not find Donald Trump guilty of, a, of an insurrection or rebellion. In fact, he was acquitted of that in the trial of his impeachment in January of 2021. But no, no, leave it to Colorado to have a trial, and then Colorado will determine that he's guilty, and then Colorado will determine he can't be on the ballot. So we'll just have states play this game. We, the state of Texas, have determined that Joe Biden is guilty of bribery and other high crimes and misdemeanors, and that therefore Congress should have impeached him, uh, should impeach him and remove him from office. Therefore, we cannot in good conscience put him on our ballot. You have no more power to do that than the state of Colorado does to determine Donald Trump's guilt when he hasn't even been charged with that in federal court, since it is a federal offense, not a state offense. But why not? Have at it. Have at it. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Let's just keep doing this all day. In fact, the second impeachment trial against President Trump fell well short of the number of senators needed to convict him for the events of January 6th. As a result, Mark writes, he was not barred under Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution from holding and enjoying any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. If anything, there was a constitutional adjudication in Trump's favor. All right, I got a lot more to say on this, obviously. This is breaking news here on the Mark Levin Show. It's great to be with you tonight on such a very, very important night as we break down this ridiculous, undemocratic ruling by the, by the Colorado Supreme Court, which will surely be challenged any moment now by the United States Supreme Court, and hopefully they will see it right. 877-381-3811. This is the Mark Levin Show coming right back. Mark Levin. Traveling for the holidays? Pure Talk has you covered because they just added international roaming to over 30 countries. That's right. Whether you're making calls from the Vatican or on a beach in the Bahamas, you're covered. From the steps of Buckingham Palace or your villa in Santorini, you dial away. And here's the best part. There is no rate increase. Pure Talk still saves the average family almost $1,000 a year with plans starting at just 20 bucks a month. And they put you on America's most dependable 5G network. So the coverage is second to none. 
So don't delay, folks. Switch to Pure Talk, a veteran-owned wireless company with simply the best U.S. customer service team. Now with international roaming to over 30 countries. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin, that's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-M, to make the switch, and you'll save an additional 50% off your first month. That's big. That's puretalk.com slash Levin to start saving on wireless right now. The Colorado Supreme Court has actually handed Donald Trump a great gift here in some ways, because they are just going to fire up and rally his base even more. And there's there, you, you cannot in in any way, shape or form, if a Republican candidate comes out in any way condones this, that person should be removed from the party immediately. I mean that if any of them and I haven't seen what the other candidates have said. But if any of Trump's challengers come out and say he should be disqualified, they should be removed from the Republican Party by whatever process that is. I don't even know what that is, but they should. It should apply to them because this is, again, this is a leftist court that is trying to usurp the will of the voters and usurp the role of the Constitution and Congress. That's what's happening here because Colorado hates Trump. They want to deny Coloradans the right to vote for him. And their reasoning here is so incredibly stupid. I'm, I'm reading the, the, their arguments here. See, the lower court, the judge said, yeah, I think Trump's guilty of an insurrection, but I don't think the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to him. Well, she's wrong on the first count, and she's correct on the second. He's not guilty of an insurrection because he he's not even been charged with that. It's a federal offense. It's not a Colorado state law, number one. Secondly... She is correct that it does not apply to him, but what the state Supreme Court has done here is they've said the judge is correct in that it applies to him, or the, the, the insurrection, he did that, but there, she's incorrect, the judge, that it doesn't apply to him. And then they come to this reasoning that even though Congress hasn't done anything here except find Trump to be acquitted, they, they determine that this is up to them. This is, this is up to them. And as I'm, I'm reading their, their reasoning here, the only mention of congressional power in Section 3 is that Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove the disqualification of a former officer who had engaged in insurrection. Section 3 does not determine who decides whether the disqualification has attached in the first place. Well, obviously, if, if that's the argument that Congress can undo it, wouldn't you then conclude Congress can do it? Or that the courts can do it, the federal courts? I mean, this is this is a ridiculous reasoning. I'll get into more detail on this, obviously. It's the Mark Levin Show. Rich Zioli in for the great one coming right back. Traveling for the holidays? Pure Talk has you covered because they just added international roaming to over 30 countries. That's right. Whether you're making calls from the Vatican or on a beach in the Bahamas, you're covered. From the steps of Buckingham Palace or your villa in Santorini, you dial away. And here's the best part. There is no rate increase. Pure Talk still saves the average family almost $1,000 a year with plans starting at just 20 bucks a month. And they put you on America's most dependable 5G network. So the coverage is second to none. So don't delay, folks. Switch to Pure Talk, a veteran-owned wireless company with simply the best U.S. customer service team. Now with international roaming to over 30 countries. Go to puretalk.com slash Levin, that's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-M, to make the switch, and you'll save an additional 50% off your first month. That's big. That's puretalk.com slash Levin to start saving on wireless right now. Mark Levin, tough as hell. That's why I like Mark Levin. And I'm not sure a lot of people like him. He's tough as hell. But I like him. I love him. Call in now. 877-381-3811. Yes, indeed. The great one is off tonight. And it is me, Rich Zioli, with you from Mark's hometown of Philadelphia. It's amazing to think that in Philadelphia, where the Constitution was ratified, We now have Colorado determining that it has authority that the Constitution does not give the state of Colorado to bar a person from being on the ballot for something that they have not been charged with, much less convicted of, in federal court. And the process, which is not defined in the Constitution, Colorado then interprets that, that they get the right to do it. And that's basically their reasoning here. By the way, if you want to follow along on social media, I'm at Rich Zioli, R-I-C-H-Z-E-O-L-I. You can also call the show 877-381-3811. But what, what the argument that the court is laying out here, and, and, and this is absurd. This is really absurd. Their argument is basically this. 
since Congress doesn't really explain how we go to about, go about barring somebody, then we can determine that we can do it ourselves. Since they didn't, since they didn't say how to do it, we then have decided that we we can do it. So since there's no explicit instructions on how somebody gets barred from being on the ballot under the 14th Amendment, Section 3, therefore, we get to decide. Because it doesn't say we can't decide and it doesn't say how to do it. So then we just, we, we just do it. And, and the court contradicts itself here when it says, Section 3 does not determine who decides whether the disqualification has attached in the first place. Right, but it, but it, it was very clear at the time of the 14th Amendment, Section 3's passage of the ratification of who that included. You didn't have to speci specify it. We just fought a civil war. We just fought a civil war. Obviously, we know who the Confederates were. We know who the Democrats were, in other words. We didn't have to do trials. We didn't have to do congressional hearings. We knew who the Confederacy was. They were very proud of the fact that they were Confederate States of America. It was self-evident. But they don't list that in the Colorado Supreme Court's reasoning. They leave that out. They just go, oh, well, Congress didn't say, so therefore we get to say. No, Congress, the, the Constitution doesn't need to say because we just fought a civil war. So it's obvious. It's evident. It's self-evident who the Confederacy was. It's self-evident who led the rebellion against the United States of America. And then Congress gives itself the ability, under the 14th Amendment, Congress then has the ability to essentially pardon that person and make them eligible for the offices that are listed in the 14th Amendment, Section 3. But the Colorado Supreme Court pretends as if this amendment was not ratified after the Civil War. They leave that out. Like it was ratified in, uh, you know, 1972 or something like that. They just randomly decided to come up with an insurrection clause in the Constitution for no reason. Except that, obviously, it was very evident with the passage of the Civil War amendments, including the 13th, which barred slavery, which outlawed slavery, that if the Confederate states wanted back in the Union, they had to accept these these amendments. They had to they had to agree to these. This was the this was this was the price to pay. You want to come back in? You have to agree to these amendments. And one of them said, none of you who engaged in this rebellion against the United States, none of you are eligible to be a senator, a member of Congress, an elector or of the president or vice president, or hold an office of the United States. But they still allowed the ability of one of them to become president because they didn't feel, I'm guessing, at the time, that it would be okay to bar somebody from that office. That's the only conclusion I can make. Obviously, none of us were there for that. But they left the presidency out of it for a reason. But let's think about this now. This is what the, the, the reasoning of the Supreme Court is here. In, uh, interveners, however, look to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which provides that Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article to argue that congressional authorization is necessary for any enforcement of Section 3. The argument does not withstand scrutiny. The Supreme Court has said that the 14th Amendment is undoubtedly self-executing without any ancillary legislation. So as far as its terms are applicable to any existing state of circumstances, the court was directly focused on the 13th Amendment in civil rights cases so that this statement could be described as dicta. But an examination of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, the Reconstruction Amendments, and interpretation of them supports the accuracy and broader significance of the statement. But again, they're, they're, leaving, they're leaving out the fact that we just fought a civil war and that it was evident who the rebels were. Like they're leaving that, they're just completely glossing over that fact. Section 3 is one of four substantive sections of the 14th Amendment. Section 1, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Section 2, representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Section 3, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office under the United States who, having previously taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same. Section 4, the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. Obviously, all of these things have to do with the post-Civil War reconstruction of the United States of America. 
So that's why Congress doesn't, that's why the Constitution doesn't specify in that part how they go about determining who committed a rebellion or an insurrection. But obviously, I would think at the time what they would rely on was what they also wrote here, which is due process. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you make that conclusion? I mean, they literally write here in the 14th Amendment, section number one, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So wouldn't you then make the determination that as they're thinking of the 14th Amendment's application to those who committed an insurrection, if they obviously knew who the rebels were, because we just fought the Civil War, so that was the easy part, but thinking in the future, there's another insurrection, there's a, there's a rebellion against the United States of America. Wouldn't it then follow that the implication is you don't get to deny a person their right to be on the ballot without due process of law. So then what is due process of law in this context? It would be a federal court that has a trial where federal charges are laid out that this person has committed an insurrection or rebellion or given aid and comfort to those who have in federal court. And due process would have to follow through and that person would have to be found guilty. Or that Congress would make that determination through the course of its own proceedings. Since Congress can make that determination, I would presume, since they, they Congress, can undo it. But at no point does it say that, a, that a, a state just gets to make that determination all by itself. This is the federal constitution. We're talking about federal laws and federal applications of those laws. And then if you're going to then deny somebody their due process rights to be on the ballot which is a huge deal to say that we in this state, we have de we're depriving you of your ability to be on the ballot, but we're not giving you due process. They can't give Donald Trump due process in Colorado because he hasn't broken Colorado law. Think about that. How can you give Donald Trump due process in the state of Colorado? Donald Trump has not broken Colorado law. He's not been accused of breaking Colorado law. And there's nothing in the Constitution that says if you break Colorado law, you can't be president. So obviously what that means then is the framers of the 14th Amendment, the ratifiers and everybody else, implied for due process to count before anybody loses their life, liberty, or property. Due process. But the only way you can have due process in this count is if somebody makes an accusation in federal court, meaning the government charges you with a crime of insurrection or giving aid and comfort to those who have, and then you're found guilty. And then it goes through all the various appeals, and then ultimately that determination is made. At that point, then, you can make an argument that a state doesn't need Congress to tell it what to do in that sense, that then, then the 14th Amendment becomes self-executing. You can make that argument at that point, but they're not even doing that. Colorado's not doing that. They're just rushing past all that. They're, they're, they're scrapping that whole pesky due process part and going right to the fact of, well, it's self-executing, so we're going to execute it and in the process execute democracy at the same time and say that a person who's not been convicted of a federal crime of insurrection or giving aid and comfort thereof is not eligible to be on the ballot in our state. We get to do that. We get to determine that. We have the power to do that ourselves. What? How does the state of Colorado have the authority to do this? How does the state of Colorado, by watching the January 6th committee hearings, then make the determination that Donald Trump is guilty? They're not a federal court. It's a state. They don't have the right to do this. These are not federal charges, and Donald Trump hasn't even been charged with them. So now a state turns around and says it's self-executing. We can just take him off the ballot ourselves. No, no, it, you could argue, again, you could make an argument that it's self-executing in the sense that if Donald Trump would have been found guilty of giving aid and comfort or committing an insurrection or whatever, that then the states just do it automatically. They take him off the ballot. You could make that argument being self-executing in that manner. But first, there has to be that, that whole pesky due process thing. That whole pesky due process, which, of course, you and I both understand to be a trial under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments of the Constitution, where you have due process and you have a jury of your peers and you're found guilty. Has that happened here? No, it has not. Now, I'm not even getting into the fact of, even if, it, 
you do have a trial, and even if Trump's found guilty, I still don't think this applies to him because the word president's not there. But let's just leave that out of it for just a second. Where is the due process for Donald Trump? Obviously, the, the writers of the 14th Amendment were acutely aware of the need to stress due process under the law before anybody's deprived of their life or their liberty. Donald Trump's being deprived of his liberty, which is the liberty to run for president. The Constitution's very, very, very open. You know, you only need a few qualifications to be president. It's your age, it's your, your, your citizenship, how many years you lived here. It's pretty simple. That's it. Don't need an IQ test. Don't need money. Don't need good looks and charm, although it helps. But you don't need those things. So then you have the liberty, as long as you're 35 and you are born in the United States and you've lived here for the set number of years, you have the liberty then to run for president. So if a state's going to deny you, deprive you of your liberty to run for president, obviously they want due process to be involved. So where's the due process? It wasn't necessary to put in a procedure to determine who was part of the Confederacy when the 14th Amendment was adopted. Much like you didn't need a procedure to determine who was a slave when the 13th Amendment was adopted. There's, no, there's nothing in the 13th Amendment that says, oh, and in order to determine if somebody was a slave, the following must occur, blah, blah, blah. No, it was self-evident. We knew who the slaves were, and we knew who the Confederates were. So these things were very self-evident. So you didn't have to really list all these things. But they left it in a way that if in the future something were to occur, then that person would have to go through due process, obviously. And the Confederates knew who they were. The Confederates knew what they did, and the Confederates surrendered. And the Confederacy surrendered, and then they adopted these amendments to, uh, to be welcomed back into the Union. And then the rest is history, as they say. But now the state of Colorado has decided due process doesn't exist and that they have the right to make these determinations on the federal level. So that's why I said to you before, then what stops a state from turning around and saying, we believe the president is guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, and uh, we're keeping him off the ballot. And we, we've determined that, that uh, it's, it's self-executing that he can't be on our ballot because, well, you know, I mean, Congress should have done these things. And since Congress didn't, uh, but we know he's guilty, we can do it anyway. Yeah, we'll just do it anyway. He really isn't eligible to serve in office because he really did commit high crimes and misdemeanors. I mean, forget the fact that Congress didn't find him guilty of that, but that's okay. We know he did it, so we'll just keep him off our ballot. Tell us we can't. I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous to make this idea that nobody has found Donald Trump guilty of these things, but the state of Colorado gets to make the determination all on their own and then keep him off the ballot. Even though there is a procedure in the Constitution called the impeachment clause, which the president was found, he was impeached, which is a charge, and then he was found not guilty in the Senate. So the only argument you can make is that if there was a process and a procedure, he was acquitted. Therefore, he did not commit these things against the United States of America. That's the only legal, the only precedent in this entire matter, which, of course, the state of Colorado doesn't even mention in their 213 page opinion here is that Donald Trump was acquitted in the Senate. So if you're looking at due process, that's the only conclusion you can come to is that he was acquitted. So then at that point, the state has absolutely no merit whatsoever to keep him off the ballot. If they're adding Congress into the equation. All right, 877-381-3811. It's the Mark Levin Show. It's Rich Zeolian for the great one. More to say on this. A lot more to say. Don't go away. Mark Levin. Traveling for the holidays? Pure Talk has you covered because they just added international roaming to over 30 countries. That's right. Whether you're making calls from the Vatican or on a beach in the Bahamas, you're covered. From the steps of Buckingham Palace or your villa in Santorini, you dial away. And here's the best part. There is no rate increase. Pure Talk still saves the average family almost $1,000 a year with plans starting at just 20 bucks a month. And... They put you on America's most dependable 5G network, so the coverage is second to none. So don't delay, folks. Switch to Pure Talk, a veteran-owned wireless company with simply the best U.S. customer service team. Now with international roaming to over 30 countries. 
Go to puretalk.com slash Levin. That's puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-M to make the switch. And you'll save an additional 50% off your first month. That's big. That's puretalk.com slash Levin to start saving on wireless right now. I'll tell you what. A couple of the uh, presidential candidates have waited here. Chris Christie saying, quote, Donald Trump should not be prevented from being president by any court. He should be prevented from being president of the United States by the voters of this country. Well, at least he's acknowledging that the court is uh, massively overreaching here. Vivek Ramaswamy coming out and saying the following. Uh, It's much longer. He said, this is what an actual attack on democracy looks like in an un-American, unconstitutional, and unprecedented decision. A cabal of Democrat judges are barring Trump from the ballot in Colorado. Having tried every trick in the book to eliminate President Trump from running in this election... The bipartisan establishment is now deploying a new tactic to bar him from ever holding office again, the 14th Amendment. I pledge to withdraw from the Colorado GOP primary unless Trump is also allowed to be on the state's ballot. And I demand that Ron DeSantis, Chris Christie, and Nikki Haley to do the same immediately, or else they are tacitly endorsing this illegal maneuver, which will have disastrous consequences for the country. Today's decision is the latest election interference tactic to silence political opponents and swing the election for whatever puppet the Democrats put up by the time by this time of depriving Americans of every right to vote for their candidate of choice. The 14th Amendment was part of the Reconstruction Amendments that were ratified following the Civil War. It was passed to prohibit former Confederate military and political leaders from holding high federal or state office. These men had clearly taken part in a rebellion against the United States, the Civil War. That makes it all the more absurd that a left-wing group in Colorado is asking a federal court to disqualify the 45th president on the same grounds, equating his speech to rebellion against the United States. And there is another legal problem. Trump is not a former officer of the United States, as that term is used in the Constitution, meaning Section 3 does not apply. As the Supreme Court explained in Free Enterprise Fund v. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board in 2010, quote, an officer of the United States is someone appointed by the president to aid him in his duties under Article 2, Section 2. The term does not apply to elected officials and certainly not to the president himself. The framers of the 14th Amendment would be appalled to see this narrow provision intended to bar former U.S. officials who switched to the Confederacy from seeking public office being weaponized by a sitting president and his political allies to prevent a former president from seeking re-election. Our country is becoming unrecognizable to our founding fathers. In addition to that, not only the framers, but those who ratified the amendment as well. They would also be saying the same things. Good for Vivek. That's an excellent statement. Good for him. A lot more to get to on this. I want to get your reaction. 877-381-3811. I'll tell you exactly why they're doing this. Exactly why they're doing this at the top of the hour. It's the Mark Levin Show. Coming right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. The Colorado Supreme Court has decided that you will not get a say in who you can vote for for president because they are going to usurp the will of the voters and decide to bar an American citizen without due process from being on the ballot. Welcome back to the Mark Levin Show. The great one is off tonight. It's me, Rich Zioli, in for Mark. An honor to be with you tonight and tomorrow night as well. I'm excited for that. First of all, I've been talking about this since really the beginning of the show tonight because this came out about 6.15 tonight, and Mr. Producer and I couldn't believe it in the middle of a monologue I look down and see the breaking news, Colorado bars Trump for being on the ballot. Uh, The main thing is this, and this is why they're doing this. Joe Biden is going to lose. They don't want Joe Biden to lose, but he's going to lose, and they know that. And what they want to do, the Democrats, is they want to swap Joe Biden out and put in another candidate. But Donald Trump is so popular that even Politico, and I mentioned this in the opening monologue today at the start of the show, even Politico wrote a piece that Mexicans are looking forward to Trump's return as in Mexican-Americans in places like El Paso, Texas. Trump is winning. Biden is losing. Every day the polls get worse and worse for Biden. There was a story today about a pollster who worked with James Carville 
And he said, this is grim. But the key part about it is that this has been getting worse for Biden. The economic messaging, the economic reaction to that messaging is getting worse and worse. Biden is getting more and more unpopular as time goes on. People are feeling more and more disengaged from supporting him, even his own supporters. It is a cascading destruction of Biden's reelection campaign. And that's why they're doing this, because Donald Trump can win. And remember, the establishment will be happy with any of the other Republicans, for the most part. They really would. I mean, well, really, Nikki Haley. The establishment would be fine with her. DeSantis, uh, not as much. But, but Nikki Haley, yes. She'll give them what they want. She'll do what they want. She'll be a puppet for the establishment. That's why the establishment is now rushing to Nikki Haley's defense, trying to prop her up, trying to get her all this money. So they will be happy with Nikki Haley. But Trump is a danger to the establishment on both sides of the political aisle. And because he's going to beat Biden and they can't get Biden out of the race because Biden's such a stubborn old goat, they have no choice but to try to keep him off the ballot. Now, here's the danger. <clears throat> I've already outlined for you in much detail why I do not believe, nor does Mark, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to presidents, just based on the fact that the word is not there. The freaking word is not there. That's number one. Number two, I've spent great detail explaining how the Colorado Supreme Court has not applied any due process here whatsoever. Donald Trump has not been charged with an insurrection or giving aid and comfort, has not been found guilty of those things. But the timing on this is very, very suspect. And I don't trust anything. And I'm very much like Vito Corleone in The Godfather when I say I'm a superstitious man. And if lightning should strike, I'm going to blame some of the people in this room tonight. Here's what I'm talking about. The timing of this works in the favor of those trying to keep Trump off the ballot. The Colorado Supreme Court has put a stay on this ruling until January 4th. January 5th is their deadline to organize their ballots for the state's Republican primary. The Supreme Court may or may not have the time to rule on this by then, and the Supreme Court may tell Colorado, go scratch. We'll, we'll, we'll decide when we're ready, and you wait, and you, you wait to do your ballots until we tell you to. That very much may happen. Very likely will happen. It's obvious, though, that the Supreme Court could come back and say, since Donald Trump has not been charged with or found guilty of the state of Colorado has no right. We're not going to make a determination on whether Section 3 applies to a president or somebody seeking the presidency until we actually have somebody who's found guilty of those things. The court may come back with that and say that. They may say, look, look it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid question of whether or not Section, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to presidents or those seeking the presidency, but uh, we can't even begin to tackle that question because... More broadly, the person in question, Donald J. Trump, has not been found guilty of any of the things that the state of Colorado is alleging. So in, and, and until and at such time, we will then render that, that opinion separately. The court could do that. They, they like narrow rulings, and that's an easy one, right? Just pump, punt it back and say, listen, Trump has not been charged with an insurrection. He hasn't been charged with giving aid and comfort. He certainly hasn't been found guilty of those things. So until that happens... Uh, You've you got to keep him on the ballot. In which case, then, <clears throat> Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, turns around and says, I need to uh, charge Trump with these crimes. And then turns around and adds charges to the federal indictment, saying that Donald Trump gave aid and comfort. I don't think he'll go as far as to say that Donald Trump led an insurrection or participated in an insurrection, but I think he'll say that Donald Trump gave aid and comfort to those who did, which would cover the language in the 14th Amendment, Section 3, for those purposes. And then a kangaroo court in D.C. will find him guilty like they find everybody guilty every single time when it comes to January 6th because you can't get a fair trial in the, in the District of Columbia. And then at that point, then Colorado and other blue states will turn around and say, well, since the 14th Amendment self-executing, we are now going to take him off the ballot. In which case, then the Supreme Court hears it again. And the Supreme Court says, okay, now we have to tackle the question of whether Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to presidents. Now, I believe that based on the fact that we have many justices on the court, a majority of whom, who believe in the text of the, of the Constitution. They're textualists. They're originalists. They look at the actual meaning at the time it was passed. I think they would conclude that the framers of the 14th Amendment, the ratifiers, the adopters, all the people mentioned did not believe 
president should count, which is why they didn't mention the word. They mentioned senator. They mentioned member of the House. They mentioned electors to the president and vice president. So very specifically, they mentioned that. They mentioned officers of the United States, and the court has concluded that officers of the United States are people that are appointed by the president. But they don't mention president, and therefore it was their intent at the time that the presidency not be included in this prohibition. For whatever reason. That the absence of the word is everything. That you don't have to really spend much time trying to understand and get into the mindset of the framers of the 14th Amendment. You just have to realize that the word is not there. So obviously they didn't want it to apply. Because if they wanted it to apply, they would have just listed it. Because they listed all these other officers. They, they took the time out of their day, out of their very busy reconstruction lives, to list the offices that they did not want people to be able to hold. So then you can just easily conclude in like a one-page brief, well, then they should have mentioned president too. If they wanted the presidency to count, they should have just added the word. You know, they weren't getting charged by the letter back then. They could have absolutely added the word. It wouldn't have changed a damn thing. But to let us assume that they meant to add the word or they meant to imply the word, even though they didn't add the word, that's a stretch. So we're going to go with what they didn't say. They didn't say president, therefore it doesn't count to the president, period. And then end it, and that's it. That's all you got to do. It's a quick one-page ruling by the Supreme Court that should be a unanimous opinion. It should be like this, a very simple test. Is the word president there? No? Okay, well, then it doesn't count to the president. It doesn't, doesn't count. Do you see the word president here? Um, da, 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 Senator, electors, uh, House member, uh, no. Okay, then what's not there? Uh, president. Right. So who, who then doesn't it affect? Uh, president? Right. It's like a very simple childlike logic question. A childlike game. Hey, what word isn't here? Um, da, 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 president? Right. Who do you think they meant to leave out? Um, the commissioner of the uh, Water Commission in Essex County, New Jersey? No, 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 no. Stick with me here. They were talking about federal offices, federal offices. They didn't list what office? President, right. So therefore, which office does this not apply to? Uh, senator? No, 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 senator's there. They, they listed that one. Um, member of the House? No, nope, that's there too. Uh, electors of the president? Nope, 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 also there. Want to try one more time? Um, they didn't list president there because they didn't want president to count? Right. Okay, I got it right. Awesome. What do I win? It's not that complicated. It really isn't. It's not that complicated. But this goes to the heart of everything we've talked about for years. I remember when uh, Mark and I first met, <clears throat> actually, was back in the early aughts, as they say, the mid-twos, and his book, Men in Black, had just come out. And I was involved in Republican Party politics in New Jersey. And he was our guest speaker at a political dinner that I ran. And everybody got a signed copy of Men in Black. And Mark spoke. And it was great. And we hit it off. And he's been nothing but an incredibly kind and generous mentor of my radio career ever since. And I'm eternally grateful to him for that. But we hit it off at night. And uh, Men in Black is still, in my opinion, my favorite book of his only because I love the courts and I love the law and I love the whole process. And he does a great job of explaining how these unelected judges in black robes make all these determinations that they're not supposed to make because the legislature is supposed to make them. And yet the court just legislates from the bench. And he went into great detail about Korematsu and Roe and all kinds of other decisions. Dred Scott, um, the separate but equal decision under the United States Constitution that the court got so wrong when they said separate but equal is constitutional. Dred Scott, how a person can be property. I mean, Mark did a great job explaining all those things. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about unelected or elected in Colorado. I don't know how they work. It doesn't matter. We're talking about judges who are supposed to interpret the law, making the law. We're talking about people whose job it is to interpret the law as it's written, deciding for us the way things are going to be. And they did the same thing in Pennsylvania in 2020. In 2020, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court came out and said, even though the law is clear, 
about how those ballots are supposed to be counted, we, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, are going to usurp the legislature and say that the law, as it's written, does not apply. We're going to write new law from the bench. Men and women in black determining for themselves and for all of us what the law really should be. And in the state of Colorado, they've done the exact same thing, determining that you should not have the ability to vote for Donald Trump. And they're doing all this because Joe Biden's going to lose. Joe Biden is a terrible, terrible candidate. Joe Biden is one of the absolute worst candidates to ever run for the presidency. And there's nothing that can save this man. Nothing. But the problem is, even if you swap out Joe Biden, I still think Trump wins. I do. I think Trump is so popular right now. I think people have had it with this administration. I think people that even don't like Trump's mean tweets wish they could get a mean tweet right now. Just to have America be where it was four years ago. With a secure southern border and we weren't, there weren't wars going on across the world and the American economy was much stronger. That's what I think. And so I think they will pull out any stops they possibly can to stop him. So if the court comes back, the Supreme Court, and says it doesn't count the Trump because he hasn't been found guilty of those things, then look for the special counsel, Jack Smith, to then add those charges to Trump. If he doesn't do it anyway, he may just do it anyway. And then look for a jury to find him guilty and then look for the states to then turn around and say he's barred from being on the ballot. And then the Supreme Court will have to hear it again and make the determination about whether Section 3 applies to presidents, which, again, is very easy to determine. Is the word president here? Yes or no? Check this box. Do you see the word president? No? Yes. Check the box. Very simple. Very easy. You don't need a law degree to figure that out. You just have to just do the little word game that I do with my kids. And we sit there at diners and they have those hidden word puzzles and we got to try to find the words. Well, in this case, it's very simple. What word isn't here? President? Right. So which office does does this not apply to? President? Right. Bingo. Get this kid an ice cream cone. 877-381-3811. It's the Mark Levin Show. The great one is off tonight. It's me, Rich Zioli, in for Mark, coming right back. Mark Levin. All right, 877-381-3811 here on the Mark Levin Show. President Trump responded, former President Trump, excuse me, I don't want to trigger anybody, uh, responded to, which by the way, you can still call former presidents president. It's not a big deal. It's etiquette and it's fine. But some people get very, very upset. President Trump responded to, we, we think he responded to the Colorado Supreme Court. It certainly sounds a lot like it as he was speaking earlier tonight. Take a listen. It's no wonder crooked Joe Biden and the far left lunatics are desperate to stop us by any means necessary. They are willing to violate the U.S. constitutions at levels never seen before in order to win this election. Joe Biden is a threat to democracy. It's a threat. They're weaponizing law enforcement for high level election interference because we're beating them so badly in the polls. You know, if you don't if Democrats were serious about their nonsense about defending democracy and letting democracy prevail and all the other stuff, they would never try a stunt like this. They would never would, would do that. But Democrats don't believe in democracy. First of all, we are a constitutional republic, as you know, but they don't believe in democracy. They don't. They, they want majority mob rule is what they want. That's not democracy. They want a very small group of people based essentially on the coast, California, New York, to decide for everybody else. And they believe their way is right, and you should never challenge them, and everybody must agree to their Marxist vision for America. And if you get out of line, they will cancel you, even if you want their own. You know, even if you want your own, their own and you agree with nine out of ten things, if you say support Israel, but you support all the other wacky things the Democrats support, they'll still cancel you. They'll come after you. They want to determine everything, and they don't want dissent. That's why they crack down on so-called misinformation and disinformation, because they don't want you to disagree with them. They don't want to give you the ability to do so. They want to tell you how to think on pandemics and climate and everything else. They want to tell you that science is real, except biology is not. Biology can change. Genders can change. They want to tell you that. And if you disagree with them, they just want to cancel you, silence you, call you names and shut you up. They actually don't want a democracy at all. They don't want people participating and disagreeing and then voting. And they want they want a totalitarianism is what they want. That's why totalitarians are on the left. They always are. 
it, despite what history says about certain tyrants like Mussolini and others being on the right, no, no, they're, they're on the left. The, these people that shut down dissent and use the powers of their law enforcement for political purposes, they are always on the left. Their outcomes are on the left. What they eventually do with their economy is on the left. The same with Hitler. It's the same thing. Socialist, national socialist, their ideas are always from the idea of the left, using government for the greater good, taking away individual liberty and property for the greater good, determining for everyone else for the greater good. In this case now, taking away the ability of Coloradans to vote for who they want, taking away their ability to cast a ballot for the candidate of their choice for the greater good. They'll decide for us. Four people in black robes will decide for everybody else. And then other blue states will follow suit. And they'll all try the same nonsense. Because they do not want dissent, because tyrants never do. It doesn't work in totalitarianism. That's why they don't allow it. It's the Mark Levin Show. We're coming right back. The Mark Levin Show is tomorrow's morning show. You can reach Mark now at 877-381-3811. You know, it's so funny. Um, I was saying to Mr. Producer before, we had a whole show planned out, all these audio cuts, everything like that. This is how it works these days. And then I get on the air, and this ruling comes down out of Colorado. So all the show prep goes out the window. That's okay, though. We have to roll with it. We got to roll with it. It's how we do things on the Mark Levin Show. It's me, Rich Zeolian, for the great one tonight. Normally, I can be heard from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Talk Radio 1210 WPHD in Philadelphia, Mark's hometown. It's always an honor when I get to be with you tonight and hang out. I'll be back tomorrow night. Uh, Mark has graciously extended me the offer to come back tomorrow. I haven't completely blown it yet, so that's good, although we still have 20 minutes to go, so we'll see how that goes. But I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about this and excited to fight for liberty, what the court is doing in Colorado to disenfranchise voters and to take away your right to be able to choose a presidential candidate using really specious reasoning under the 14th Amendment, Section 3, is just an outrageous, outrageous moment in our in our history. No question about it. Let me take some calls, get your reaction. Let's start with uh, John in Staten Island, New York. John, you are on the Mark Levin Show with me, Rich. How are you? How you doing, Rich? I'm fine. Thank you for asking. You know, Rich, this is a numbers game for them. It's like how they stole the 20 election. They're going to, in my opinion, they they claim that Trump had no standing when he tried to apply for the for the Pennsylvania or a constitutional, uh, the, the 281 day clause. That's Trump's argument now. The state of Colorado has no has no uh, they, they have they, they they have no claim. They it's they they don't pass federal laws. They don't act on federal laws. The crime wasn't committed in their state. So how can they lay claim? Yeah, that's also, a great point. It's the, not a Colorado law. He's not accused of violating any Colorado laws. How can they make that argument? Even if he was, that would not bar him from being on the ballot. If, if, unless it's written in the Colorado Constitution and he had done it in their state, then they would have then they would have standing. But they I hope he's smart enough to argue no standing. Also, I think what they're going to do is they're going to wait to the last minute. This, their Supreme Court's going to come down in the favor of, of the four judges. And then they're going to make it where they, they, they're going to say, all right, it's got to go to the Supreme Court. And by the time the Supreme Court hands it, you know what I'm saying? This is what they did in the 20 election. They sent it up to the Supreme Court from Pennsylvania, and they said that the Pennsylvania judges were crazy, and they had to hear the cases. But at that point, they already counted the electoral colleges, which started this whole nonsense. Well, I think in this case, and John, thanks for the call, buddy. Have a great night and a Merry Christmas. I think in this case it's different because the Supreme Court has to rule. Uh, because the ballots have to be created. Ballots have to be printed and they have to be mailed out and the whole process has to happen. So the Supreme Court has to rule. But my concern is that they rule in two parts. The first part being there's no there's no issue here. Donald Trump has not been convicted of an insurrection or giving aid and comfort to those who have. So there's no there, the, the state of Colorado has no reason to bar him. And we don't even have to get into the merits of Section 3 yet because he has not been found guilty of those things, in which case then... He has to be on the ballot for now. They're always thinking a step ahead, these people on the left. They're always thinking a step ahead. 
So if that is the if that is what the court comes back and says, then watch the special prosecutor to charge Trump and watch a D.C. jury to find him guilty, in which case then the Supreme Court has to hear it again. And now they have to decide on the question of whether or not Section three applies to the presidency. So this could be multiple court dates here before the United States Supreme Court is my point. Uh, Tony is in New Jersey. Hello, Tony. You're on the Mark Levin show. Rich, it's always a pleasure, and we appreciate your clarity. You know, it's amazing how you can make things so crystal clear. But I do want to tell you what's perfectly evident about the Democrats is that they have no respect for our history and for what was going on at the time. So these people are all ignorant of what the framers of the Constitution said because they're taking everything down. And, And I just wanted to say, and I don't want to add to anything you said, but I want to say that. You know, we had Andrew Johnson, who was a Democrat president, who took over when Lincoln was assassinated, and nothing ever happened to him. He just reigned supreme, and he even got out of impeachment by, like, one vote. So it was not meant for the president, and it was also meant for people who were, um, there was a concern because elections weren't really happening, so the election criteria didn't apply, the states were doing their own thing. Our Democratic Party has no idea what our country was going through, as Mark shares in his book, Why the Democrats Hate America. They don't care about it, and they're destroying all the statues. So they're not our, they're not our constitutional code. And I thank God for Mark Levin. Amen. Tony, thank you. Merry Christmas, and I appreciate the phone call tonight. Thank you so much, and for the kind words as well. Yeah, look, I, it's, it's no, no question about it. Democrats hate America. Mark's book is spot on. The Democrat Party hates America. They want to tear America down. They always have hated America. Remember, we're talking about the Confederacy. Who was the Confederacy? The Democrat Party. The Democrat Party has an unbroken line of their hatred for America and their attempts to try to take over America and usurp this republic from the Confederacy to Woodrow Wilson to Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Lyndon Johnson to Barack Obama to this idiot in the White House now. An unbroken line. You can trace it all the way back. So it's ironic in the sense that we're talking about amendments that are passed post-Civil War amendments to keep the Confederacy, the Democrats, from taking power in this country. And now they're applying it to Donald Trump when it was never meant to be applied in this manner. Uh, Dennis is in Arizona. Dennis, you're on the Mark Levin Show. Yes, Rich. Thank you for letting me speak and thank you for uh, listening to me. You bet. I want to make a point, and I want to let you know why I'm qualified to make this point. Because I'm a motorcyclist, and I've been in that Capitol building so many times, because I used to live in Illinois. Now I'm in Arizona, so it's a lot farther. But I live 782 miles away from that Capitol building, and every year I rode to that Capitol building, every year. Sometimes I flew there twice a year. Once on a motorcycle on a uh, on a motorcycle road, and once on an airplane to ride there with a Beta of Illinois. And I'm telling you, Nancy Pelosi, who was the Speaker of the House, when you're talking about the Capitol building, she has 100 percent, 100 percent of what happens there in that Capitol building. She has the decision to do it. If she disagrees with it, it doesn't happen. If she agrees with it, it happens. And Donald Trump, I know for a fact that thousands and thousands and thousands of troops will come to that Capitol building to protect it before a couple of, a couple of weeks before the the the, uh, the the event at the Capitol building. If she said yes, there never would have been a January sixth riot. Never. Right. No, you're right. He he wanted ten thousand National Guard troops, and and they said no. You're exactly right. Dennis, thank you for the call. Merry Christmas. Uh, No question about it. Nancy Pelosi, and this is what uh, several of the Capitol Police officers said and what the chief said, the former chief. Nancy Pelosi made those decisions, and I think they wanted January 6th to happen. I mean, it's, it's the high holy day of the left for a reason, right? They keep bringing it up all the time. It's the only thing they have. They can't bring up the economy. So everything that they have is based in Donald Trump's going to destroy America and every day is going to be January 6th again. That's that's their only playbook. It doesn't work, by the way. When James Carville's group looked at polling data, 
they found out that when voters were asked, even Democrats, even Democrat leaning voters, who do you think is the party that's better prepared to protect democracy? It's Republicans. They don't buy, they're not buying this whole argument that Trump is going to destroy the country and destroy democracy and he's going to be the next Mussolini and never leave office. And always. First of all, he was president. If you're going to be a dictator, there's your chance. You're going to be the dictator when you're actually in office. Why would you leave office and then have to go through all this trouble just to come back and be a dictator? You're already there. If you're going to be a dictator, you're going to be a dictator. Dictators tend to not leave. So the argument that he's going to be a dictator the next time around is so stupid because he was already there. He had the chance. He could have done it if he wanted to. Our system would not allow it, which is the key, but they don't tell you that. And that's not what Trump is. He doesn't want to do that. He's, he, he was never intending to be that. But obviously a person with just common sense would turn around and go, I don't understand. He was president, right? So then if he was going to be a dictator, why is he not president anymore? Dictators never leave. They have to be overthrown. That's why their argument doesn't work. It's why their argument does not work here. Uh, Brian is in Pennsylvania. Brian, you're on the Mark Levin Show. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. I'm a former Bucks County boy, and I love it when you host. And uh, your clarity was really good tonight. I agree with the woman. Um, President Trump will prevail in this. And I, I don't really care that um, this happened because I'm thrilled about it, because what I'm concerned with is whenever the Democrats do stuff like this, people, Americans in either party see that the real seditious enemies to our country are the Democrats. So no matter how the path gets to the Supreme Court, um, President Trump will prevail. And I think it's so bizarre that we're talking about the Confederacy and and the, uh, the amendment because we know the Democrats want a two-state solution in Israel. So perhaps this is a bizarre attempt to raise the Confederacy again. And I know that's a silly thing to say, but in closing, Trump will prevail, and th these type of stunts are causing – patriotic Americans on both in both parties to see who the real enemy of our country is. And it's the left. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah, look, if the Supreme Court rules on this, it's very simple. It's a very simple ruling. Is the word president there? Yes or no? Check this box. Yes or no? It's not that complicated. It's like the old thing when you were a kid, you'd hand a girl a note. Do you like me? Check this box. Is the word president here? Yes or no? Check this box. It's very simple. It's a very simple ruling. If they wanted it to include the president, why didn't they list the word president? They weren't running out of ink. They knew what the title was. They knew the office. They look, list the electors to president. Very simple. That's what I, I think the court will come back and say, because you were, we are lucky to have textualists and originalists on the bench. We're lucky in that sense. But it's very possible they may come back even sooner and say there's not even a case to hear here because Donald Trump has not been found guilty of any of those things. In which case, then they decide on that later. And in which case, then Jack Smith, the special counsel, then throws more charges at Trump. And then a D.C. jury kangaroo court just finds him guilty. So there's a couple different ways this could go. But ultimately, I think he prevails. I do. I think he prevails. And even if they find him guilty of an insurrection or giving aid and comfort to, an, to a rebellion, I still think the Supreme Court says Section 3 doesn't apply. It doesn't count. And I certainly don't think a guilty verdict in that matter would hurt him in any way politically. I think people see through all of this. So I think he's going to be just fine. It's just more about the fact that it's annoying that a court once again decides it's going to take away the will of the voters. It's going, to, it's going to usurp the role of the legislature. It's going to usurp the United States Constitution. It's going to give itself extra powers it doesn't have. You know, for the, for the Colorado Supreme Court to turn around and say, well, since the process is silent on how we determine this, we then conclude that we can make the determination. What? That's ridiculous. Because you think he's guilty of an insurrection that gives you the right to keep him off the ballot without due process in federal court? Are you kidding me? And that you determine that the presidency obviously is included, even though the word's not there. So you decide that. So therefore, it's decided. I mean, it, give me a break. You know, it's, it's kind of it's, it's nonsense and people see through it. 
And I think everybody understands what this is about. This is about stopping Trump from being on the ballot because they know he's going to win. It's the only shot they have. The only shot they have of maintaining power, besides, of course, mass rampant cheating, which I still don't think is going to help them this time around. There's no COVID anymore. Uh, the, 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 you know, bumbling old vegetable in the basement can't hide anymore. He's got to come out and actually speak. So it's not going to save him. It's not. But that's the only thing they have is to try to keep him from being on the ballot. Short of that, he wins. They know this and they're panicked. They're terrified of this. Short of keeping him off the ballot, he wins. That's the only play they have left. And I don't think it's going to work. That's the good news. 877-381-3811. It's the Mark Levin Show. It's me, Rich Zioli from Talk Radio 1210 WPHD in Mark's hometown of Philadelphia. Coming right back. Mark Levin. All right. As... Uh, this case unfolds. There's going to be a lot more to talk about. I'm, I'll be back with you tomorrow for all the breaking news updates around this. And uh, it's been a lot of fun being with you tonight. I'm trying to get a couple calls in before I turn it over to you to enjoy the rest of your night. How about Mark is a trucker in South Dakota. Mark, you're on the Mark Levin Show. Hi, thank you, Rich. Uh, you know, you had to change your show, so I'm going to change what I, I was going to say. I'll call tomorrow with that point. But I was going to say, hey, Colorado, why don't you show you're not biased and take Joe Biden off your uh, your ballot, too, because, and I quote, when he said, if you don't like the Roe v. Wade turnover, why don't you go to the Supreme Court Justice's house and protest? He never said peacefully or patriotically like Trump did. They went to their houses and they protested and they threatened them, uh, justices and their families. And that, to me, is creating an insurrection to the Supreme Court. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, and it violates federal law, and you could absolutely argue that. Uh, why not? Mark, let's just have states make those determinations all by themselves. And we can have some states keep uh, certain candidates off and others keep the others off. It'll be great. It'll be, it'll be mass chaos, but at least it'll be entertaining. Thank you for the call. Rob is a trucker in Iowa. Rob, you're on the Mark Levin Show. Go ahead. Hey, Rich, I just wanted to make a quick point. Um, didn't a couple of years ago Colorado kind of do away with the Electoral College in favor of they have to vote for the popular vote? And what happens if Donald Trump wins the pop popular vote? Yeah, well, I mean, first he's got to be on the ballot, right? So that's their that's their first little snarky attempt to try to keep him off the ballot. I think they know it's going to fail, but they're hoping to uh, to pave the way for other blue states here. But yeah, Colorado is as it, this court is as left as it comes, no question about it. And uh, let's hope the Supreme Court will do the right thing here. Thank you very much for the call, Rob. Drive safe. Uh, let's see here. Brian's in Oregon. Brian, go ahead. You get the last word. Yeah, I was I was just thinking, isn't it interesting that. Everything that the left said would happen under Trump didn't happen under Trump, but it's happening under Biden. Yeah, great point. Yeah, talk about being a dictator, right? Example. Exactly. Well said. Well said, my friend. Thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter at Rich Zioli if you would like. I'd be very happy to uh, have you do that. R I C H Z E O L I. And I'll be back with you tomorrow night here on the Mark Levin Show. Just remember this. Section three of article of the 14th Amendment does not apply to presidents. Number one. Number two, Donald Trump has not been found guilty of an insurrection or giving aid and comfort to those who have. There's been no due process here whatsoever for the former president. Everything Colorado is doing is completely and utterly outrageous, unconstitutional, and I don't believe will stand up to the scrutiny of the United States Supreme Court. Have a great rest of your night tonight. Thanks to Mr. Producer. Thanks to Stephen for screening the calls. I'll be back with you tomorrow here on The Mark Levin Show. God bless.